So, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I thank Magda for giving the floor. And now I would like to tell you something about the results of our work, which is named Embate Organic Aerosol Origin at Rural Background Site in the Czech Republic. Organic aerosols are, are one of the main components of atmospheric aerosol. They're present in atmosphere, affect air climate, ecosystems, and human health. And this particle can be uh, anthropogenic or biogenic and can have a primary or secondary source. Uh, the sources of this particle are not a very good characteristic in part of Central Europe because it, we want to characterize them at rural background site in Central Europe, in uh, Bohemia Moravia Highlands, uh, at National Atmospheric Observatory Košetice. And in this presentation, I will talk about the results of uh, four measurement campaign, which characterize for uh, season of the year <clears throat> pardon, uh, 2019. <clears throat> in our work, we, we use data from two measuring instruments. Online aerosol mass spectrometer was measured by uh, seat of AMS, which measured organic aerosol mass spectrum, sulfate, nitrate, and ammonium and chloride ions. And online measurement of light absorption on aerosol was measured by ethylometer. Uh, uh, type AE333, which measure uh, concentration of black carbon and black carbon from fossil fuels and biomass burning combustion. Uh, among other, source apportionment model was used to source apportionment of organic aerosol, uh, namely positive matrix factorization model uh, was used, PMF, Oh, it's uh, positive matrix factorization. Input matrix to this model was organic aerosol uh, matrix uh, from seat of AMS. And this model recalculate this organic aerosol matrix into source specific chemical fingerprints and contribution over time. Uh, now let's talk about the results of our work. In individual season, we was characterized uh, three, uh, I'm sorry, five respectively four uh, factors, uh, sources of organic aerosols. Uh, three of these sources was in group, were in group uh, primary organic aerosols, namely traffic emission, HOA, and biomass and coal combustion, BBOA and CCOA. Uh, remaining two factors was in group secondary organic aerosol, namely less oxidized organic aerosols and more oxidized organic aerosols. Uh, these factors profile have characterized daily uh, trend, daily course, uh, which is namely related by uh, anthropogenic activities and by uh, Brunel layer height of, of atmosphere. Uh, the highest concentration of organic aerosol were measured in, in the summer season, but in summer were the lowest share of the primary sources. The highest share of primary sources were in, in winter season. Uh, on this slide, we can see how we look on meteorological condition in individual season. Uh, we will calculate backward trajectories for every hour. These trajectories was clustered for each season. And uh, we look on bundle layer height, uh, what, what was calculated from satellite measurement for every hour, and on ventilation index, which was calculated from bundle layer height and wind speed data. Uh, in individual season, uh, we have uh, four respectively five clusters. 
uh, in winter uh, thus dominate clusters from from a uh, continent and in summer spring and autumn was the main clusters from from the marine uh, the concentration of uh, factors was influenced by the by these clusters by backward trajectories the highest concentration was measured per measured you know, for uh, continental clusters in summer to for uh, southwest cluster. Uh, on this slide, we can see a daily trend of ventilation index for individual season. The lowest value uh, was measured in winter. The highest value was measured in summer. <coughs> and now we can see a correlation between concentration of individual factors with ventilation index. The highest value uh, was uh, were in winter uh, and uh, correlation between HOA factor and LOO factor uh, in, uh, in other season uh, was mainly by to the same journal uh, curves of these factors and ventilation index. Uh, in conclusion, I would, uh, the highest concentration of organic aerosol were recorded in summer, mainly due to meteorologic situation. For winter, spring, and autumn, five sources of organic aerosol were recorded. Uh, for summer, four so sources of organic aerosol. The largest share of primary factors, 28%, was found in winter, the lowest 20% in summer. In winter, is station influenced by local and regional sources, and in summer by transport. And significantly, significantly dependence on the concentration of individual factors and origin of the air masses, and on the higher of bundle layer height, was proved. Um, this work was supported by this project, and I thank you for your attention and I'm ready to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we have plenty of time for questions because this was a rather shortish uh, presentation. So, yeah. Thank you for your interesting talk. Um, I would have two questions. Uh, first, so you measured some concentrations of aerosol at some yes. site. Yes. Um, is there anything interesting or surprising uh, on these measurements? Because you mentioned that the highest concentration of organic aerosols was in summer, which is probably usual, or that people are heating using coal in winter. Mm -hmm. So is there something you would uh, like uh, to express that it's mm -hmm. something new. And the second question, you mentioned that you used a salometer for your measurements. Yes. Uh, would you be so kind and could you please tell me what is it and how does it yeah. work? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we were measured in uh, sorry. Uh, to share my screen. Uh, our measurement it's in uh, rural background site in, in Central Europe, and this site representing the uh, background of Central Europe, or the background air of Central Europe, and it's a uh, uh, very good site because there are uh, many instruments to measuring quality of air and meteorology. And because it, we can make more analysis and uh, this uh, results are good to uh, source apportionment to organic aerosols or aerosols in, in this region. And uh, source apportionment studies for this region uh, are not too much publicated. And uh, a telemeter measured a concentration of black carbon. Uh, the sampling uh, is on the 
tape, paper tape, and uh, you can uh, measure uh, how is the light absorption of aerosol because you use seven uh, light uh, atomometer, and from this you calculate concentration of black carbon. Black carbon uh, are non-refractory uh, aerosol, and uh, this affects uh, climate and uh, human health. Mm -hmm. And from this, you can calculate by a model uh, how uh, much of uh, black carbon is from uh, wood burning and from fossil fuels, uh, combustion of fossil fuel sources. Uh, black carbon is only from combustion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you will, wouldn't be able to quantify the black carbon using uh, mass spectrometry? Or... Uh, no, because by uh, mass spectrometry, uh, we can measure only uh, refractory errors. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, any more questions? I have a question. Yes? Yes, no problem. Yeah. Yes, no problem. I don't know the, the number of the slide because I didn't saw that, but um, it's uh, the slide with the different seasons. Can you um, tell me, um, uh, I don't, yes, this one, and um, before you, you, you showed another uh, slide with different uh, value concerning that. Can you explain us uh, the different variation uh, uh, between um, the value um, in relation to the uh, spring, uh, winter, to the season, in fact? Mm. Yeah. In in uh, uh, for uh, in winter, uh, the source of organic aerosols are mainly uh, regional uh, and local, local and regional, and influenced by boundary layer height and uh, ventilation index and mixing yeah. the atmosphere mm -hmm. because uh, on. Uh, this region can be an inversion of temperature and uh, in this type of meteorological situation, uh, emission from biomass burning and coal combustion are in uh, the lower in atmosphere and we measure this <coughs> fresh or less oxidized uh, emission. And in spring, uh, we, we can see uh, any changes, uh, more changes in in bundle height, in daily courses, in in day, and um, uh, longer longer uh, trajectories, yes. big trajectories, and uh, more sunlight and more reaction in in atmosphere, and this all uh, have an influence on the daily trend of this of these pollutants of this source of this profiles did you have an influence of the water or of the humidity or water content of the atmosphere or i don't know um, exactly uh, but this one yeah yeah, yeah. We, we measure uh, the relative humidity of our uh, sampling aerosol and we measure uh, relative humidity of atmosphere and uh, when when we have any in winter, uh, it's higher relative humidity of atmosphere, and uh, uh, we have uh, higher, uh, uh, bigger particles, and uh, any uh, uh, reaction in the water system uh, more than in spring. Yeah. Okay. And, okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, some more questions? Yeah. Well, but this is one. Yeah, yeah, just very short. Uh, yes. You use actually two terms which I didn't understand, and that was uh, the ventilation index and backward trajectories. Would you please be so kind and could you comment what yeah. it does it mean? Yes. Uh, backward trajectories uh, is. Uh, we look on data from measuring on many, many stations and uh, look uh, 
uh, how was the trajectory of air masses uh, which uh, come to, to our station. And uh, after then we clustered this data, these uh, trajectories to any clusters, to, to one line. And after then we can see uh, in uh, start of uh, January, we have any continental clusters and uh, was there any, uh, uh, any temperature, uh, sorry, um, <laughs> so if I understood it well, these are basically wind directions. Yes. Collected from many stations around you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like yes, and, and ventilation index is uh, from measuring of bundle layer height. Uh, bundle layer height is uh, uh, high. Uh, yeah. It's layer of the atmosphere uh, where are the mixing of the atmosphere. And uh, up, uh, up this bundle layer height is uh, inversion, can be inversion. And we measure uh, this uh, height. And after them, we uh, calculate it with wind speed and look on the mixing layer of the atmosphere. How is uh, mixing of the atmosphere? Okay, so this WS is wind speed. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, if there are if there aren't any more questions, so let's thank our speaker again. Mahdi uh, Burasi, who has pre-recorded his um, uh, his talk because of uh, a problem with vocal cords. But he'll be available for questions. So uh, Mahdi will take your questions. So Mahdi will speak to us, so to speak, uh, on how can we best eliminate pharmaceuticals from wastewater. So Mahdi, the floor is yours. Please share your Thank presentation. You. Magdalena, je n'entends rien. Merci. Okay, sorry about that. We have we seem to have a problem with the audio. Um, uh, no, I think we need to uh wait a minute. Let's see. Um We'll see if we can change the audio settings so that we can. Um, are you sure you cannot speak now? <laughs> I know, I'm sorry, but um, okay, so let's try now. Which one is this? This one? Can we share like everything? 
Okay, we'll have to start from the beginning, right? Let's learn first why we need to eliminate. Uh, can you hear it now, no. Solin? Yes. Um, no, it was uh, so. Uh, Someone didn't put a finger up. Uh, well, um, thumb up if you hear us. Okay. <laughs> My microphone. Okay, it's good for me. My okay. Yeah. So, so you heard the presentation <laughs> before. Okay. Yes. So no problem. Uh, from the beginning, yeah. so that Sondi can hear it. Okay. Great. Okay. Can you see the presentation? So, okay. yeah. Hello, everyone. I am Mehdi, a part of a drone PhD project between Charles uh, University and University of Poitiers, including working in our institute, ICPF. I am grateful to be supervised by Jack Barbie, Gwendolyn Lafay, Peter Stavari, and Peter Closer. Also, Thomas Sethamad as advisor. During this presentation, we're going to learn how can we best eliminate pharmaceuticals from wastewater. Let's learn first why we need to eliminate pharmaceuticals from wastewater. Pharmaceuticals are extensively used in various sectors, such as aquacultures, livestock, households, and hospitals. Consequently, these pollutants find their way into the wastewater treatment plants, where they are challenging to be removed. And another critical studies, including one uh, conducted on La Seine River's water quality, have detected numerous pharmaceuticals with sulfamethoxazole and tetracycline being the antibiotics with the highest concentrations. It has been proven that wastewater treatment plants are significant sources of these pollutants, not just in Paris, but that's globally. This persistence and high activity of these pollutants, even at trace concentration, have serious consequences. They can degrade ecosystems, contribute to the development of antibiotic resistance among pathogens. Thus, it is important that we address this issue. Our proposed solution is a hybrid process that combines membrane separation and catalytic wet air oxidation, offering a comprehensive and sustainable approach treating wastewater loaded with pharmaceuticals. Initially, the polluted water undergoes membrane separation, which yields to a clean water through permeation. However, the written states contain highly concentrated pollutants that inquire further treatment. To degrade this uh, written state, we employed catalytic water oxidation. This process relies on catalysts and specific conditions such as temperature and pressure. The aim is to break down the pollutants. At the end of the process, we can recover the catalysts and ensure what the water if it's fully treated and ready for industrial and natural cycles. Now, let's explore membrane separation technologies and factors we must take into consideration. We can categorize semi-permeable barriers in two types. Dense membrane, and porous membrane. The dense membrane allows diffusion of organic compounds while preventing water permeation. <laughs> this membrane provides high purity due to adjustable selectivity, utilizing vacuum as a driving force. The process is restricted to volatile compounds where the nomination of per evaporation or membrane distillation. On the other hand, porous membranes, which includes microfiltration, 
ultrafiltration, nanofiltration, reverse osmosis, and forward osmosis. They are commonly used in wastewater treatments. However, challenges such as low selectivity and flux improvement need to be addressed. Also, folding. The choice of the membrane should be based on the aim of the separation and the composition of the feed solution, including the type of pollutant like physical chemical properties, sizes, and pH of the solution. To exemplify membrane selectivity, we conducted a study where we surface modified PDMS membrane using glucidyl metacrylate through UV polymerization grafting. This modification improved the membrane selectivity as demonstrated by protraction tests where the membrane exhibited selectivity towards tramadol while repealing all antibiotics. However, interactions between pollutants can affect the separation. For instance, while a methylmetacrylate modification the membrane retained tetracycline when it is alone. However, in a mixed solution, TET was tetracycline was correlated with other pollutants due to interactions. The attention should be given to improve separation flux without improve, uh, compromising selectivity. Another example against membrane folding. We prepared single wall carbon nanotube spiced uh, membranes with different loading of 600, 400, and 200 milligrams. Yeah, yeah. These membranes underwent various modifications, including surface modification like oxidation, UV grafting, and SEO2 soaking, black phosphorus in addition. We tested this membrane through pertraction absorption and filtration experiments. Our findings reveal that an optimal loading of single wall carbon nanotubes was 200 milligrams, considering both flux and elimination. The hydrophilic membranes achieved nearly 87% removal of mixed antibiotics in just 2.3 seconds of filtration. Increasing SE, uh, increasing membrane thickness enhanced absorption capacity at the expense of the flow rates. Furthermore, SEO2 incorporation and UV grafting increased porosity and facilitated antibiotics diffusion through single wall carbon nanotubes membranes. And in the end, all the membranes successfully absorb antibiotics mix in less than five hours, with a maximum uptake of 10 milligram per centimeter square. While membrane separation are practical and widely used, they should not be utilized alone. Membrane separation generates retentate, which consists of highly concentrated pharmaceuticals. Therefore, a subsequent safe degradation process is necessary, like catalytic water oxidation, providing a sustainable degradation process for concentrated solutions. The aim of this process is to fully mineralize or, uh, the pollutants or at least degrade them into biodegradable byproducts such as acetic acids. It is essential to conduct toxicity assessments before releasing the treated water. Let's consider an example of catalytic water oxidation of tetracycline using a 1% platinum over sodium and zirconium oxides catalyst at low operation conditions. The catalyst was prepared using ion exchange methods and both hydrogen chemisorption and TEM analysis confirmed a homogeneous 
distribution of metal over the support. With nanoparticle size of 0 0.96 nanometers. The catalytic degradation tests with fresh catalysts achieved 98% tetracycline conversion in less than two hours. Second and third cycles reached 60 and 50 percent tetracycline conversion, respectively. Both curves were positively regressed, demonstrating the interrupted catalytic degradation. The used catalyst was successfully regenerated by heat treatments, and it regained its full initial activity and performance. The elemental analysis revealed carbon deposition over used catalysts of 2.3 till 3.8%. To determine whether it was carbon coke deposition or strongly absorbed tetracycline fragment, we calculated CH ratio. Interesting, interestingly, all used catalysts exhibit similar ratio to tetracycline, indicating that most disactivation results from absorbed TET fragments on the surface in the process of being degraded. Additionally, toxicity and biodegradability tests confirm that treated tetracycline solution via catalytic weight and oxidation is not toxic. To sum up, returning to the food process, the hybrid approach combines membrane separation and catalytic weight and oxidation, offering a promising solution that involves both physical separation and chemical degradation. This combination results in a more comprehensive and efficient treatment with low operating costs and reduced environmental impact. Thank you for your attention. Now, feel free to ask. Thank you. Now we have time for two very short questions. Okay. One, please. So I was quite surprised uh, you mentioned that uh, you determined the Platinum nanoparticle size zero point nine six. So, how did you calculate or measure it so precise uh, mm -hmm. Through hydrogen chemisorption, we have used the model of uh, particles. Like we, we have got first like hundred percent dispersion over the metal, and do we know that the nanoparticles of um, of a metal? It's like uh, cubes with eight uh, 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 atoms. So we assume it's just a model, and we had like around 0 0.96. And uh, the statistical measurements of the, our particles of the image of the uh, um, TEM, we had made like a. So you, know, you also use some image analysis of yes. TEM micro mesh. Mm -hmm. And we had also another uh, uh, C-course uh, serum, which was like um, had uh, available specific arrays bigger than uh, zirconium and, uh, and cerium. We couldn't uh, detect the platinum over the support because it was really sub uh, sub nanometric sizes. But. Uh, the ICP, we had one person to call Sorry. Okay, <laughs> another question? Well, it was practically the same transmission. How many molecules it's in some? It, it can be whole particles. Sorry? If the uh, size of one nanometer can be called particle, it's just cluster of molecules. It can be cluster, but uh, it's denomination if it's nanoparticle or a, a cluster. Yeah, it's between these sizes. It's nanoparticle or cluster. 
Okay. Um, more questions? Uh, I would have extremely short two questions. Uh, what of the what was the role of uh, carbon nanotubes, and uh, what was the selectivity of the oxidation process of the carbon nanotubes membranes? No, no, no. The, the catalytic matter oxidation. If you get just the carbon dioxide and water, or yes, uh, first about the selectivity uh, in the oxidation. We're not trying to be selective on some uh, compounds, but compounds are more refractive than each other. Mm -hmm. So when we are trying to degrade the pollutants, we would just would like to get all of them to by degrade with pollutants or uh, CO2. That's our aim. But of course, the, it depends on the pollutants. For example, tetracycline will degrade at 50 degrees uh, atmospheric pressure. Uh, phenol will not be degraded in this temperature. They use 160 degrees at 20 bars. So for example, the tetracycline was completely oxidized to carbon dioxide and water. Uh, uh, yes, yes. The, following the results, yes, mm -hmm. it was uh, okay. degraded to byproducts which are not toxic. Because I have made the HPLC MS, we have detected a series of uh, pollutants, uh, but it was not uh, efficient to detect all of them. So we have made toxicity tests to see if they are toxic or not. Okay, so there's some mixture of oxidative mm -hmm. products, but low concentration, and you only check it. The viral yes. mm -hmm. okay. No, please no. no. <laughs> <laughs> We're already uh, behind schedule, so I'd like to thank Mahdi once again. And go to the floor, Martin Purfest, who will speak to us about the detailed investigation of human galactins one and three by employing selectively deoxyfluorinated and acetyl. Uh, acetyl ectosamides. And acetyl ectosamides. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, Please, uh, I, I, I'm sharing or? Uh, I think so. I think, yeah. So, Lynn, can you see the yeah. shared screen? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. 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 No problem. Yeah. So, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, so in a few minutes, I would like to share with you my uh, research, uh, which is focused on investigation of uh, one interesting protein, so group, group of proteins, which, call, which are called collectins. Uh, why uh, would somebody want to do so? Uh, human collectins are proteins with binds carbohydrates. Uh, it's family of uh, 15, 16 proteins up to date, and its uh, number is still growing. So it's quite active field. And uh, here you can see the two prominent examples of collectin family, collectin one and collectin three. These two proteins are uh, they have the, the they are the most uh, biomedically significant protein from the collectin family so far. Uh, collectin one forms dimers in the solution. Uh, basically, the collectins are consist of so-called CRD carbohydrate recognition domain. It's this part which is able to recognize carbohydrates. Uh, Galactin 1 in solution forms dimers, whereas Galactin 3 forms, uh, can form oligomeric structures. This is just about the structure of Galactin. And the one uh, Galactin functions, the Galactin can function exacerbated as uh, you know, mediators of some signals. They uh, basically they uh, recognize some carbohydrate motifs on the surface of cells and they uh, regulate some processes. For example, they can regulate gene expression on immune responses. And if these processes are misregulated, it can result in cancer or type of diseases. And this is the reason why it's uh, interesting and important to study collectins, because uh, we can uh, we can therapeutically intervene some of these, uh, these conditions. For example, a Swedish pharmaceutical startup, Collecto, uh, introduced uh, its uh, collectin 3 selective inhibitor, TD139, and they were able to push it to the second phase of the clinical trials, again, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, okay, so how to study such a thing as a collectin? Uh, we can prepare a suitable probe, and we can let the probe interact with collectin to see some effect. Uh, we decided to use this uh, Dicyclide scaffold, so called LACNA or enlastic lactosamine scaffold. And uh, as you can see, the galactins are quite complex molecule. One probe is not enough. So we decided to prepare a series of probes. Uh, and we used the uh, deoxychlorination, which is in our lab a really established strategy. Uh, 
these compounds have been synthesized two years ago, so it's uh, uh, quite, I would say, old results, but it's still relevant. And uh, as you can see, we prefer all series of fluorinated compounds or in, in each possible position uh, as a replacement for hydroxyl group. After the preparation, we tested the inhibition potential of these compounds uh, to the uh, glycine one and glycine three. Just briefly, these three compounds are not interesting because they didn't bind to the glycines. So I was focused on the first three one because we can see quite interesting uh, differences in the binding potency to glycine one. For example, two prime compound, uh, maybe it's uh, good to uh, note the, the numbering is in this cycle is with prime sign, in, in this cycle it's without prime sign. So just for the wrong. And uh, let's back to, let's go back to the results. In the case of Galactin 1, uh, for example, there were quite huge difference in the affinity between two prime compound this one and three prime compound this one. Almost 15. Uh, uh, one of the magnitude uh, difference. Uh, in the collecting tree, there were no such a difference. So this actually, this was interesting uh, finding and I was focused on uh, why is that so? So I focused my attention on these two compounds and uh, when you want to study such an effect, a uh, common strategy is to establish some structure active relationship, this aka SAR. Uh, so it's some relationship between chemical structure and biological activity. In this case, uh, I used, when we look at the structure of an acetyl lactosamine, the, uh, the molecule is quite complex. To describe it properly, like uh, the conformation and um, uh, all possibilities, it's quite complex thing. But uh, if we distill uh, this uh, complexity into such into several parameters which are quantifiable and can be correlated with biological activity we can uh, for example take this hydrogen bond which binds uh, which holds together these two carbohydrate rings and uh, um, this hydrogen bond is uh, associated with the flexibility of the carbohydrate. So uh, the uh, longer hydrogen bond, higher flexibility of carbohydrate. So this uh, bond can uh, be used to uh, assess the uh, properties of the system. Also, we can use the, uh, some additional metrics, for example, P and C by the angle. This is dihedral or torsion, the first torsion, second torsion. Uh, as a whole, this data can describe the molecular structure itself. Okay, uh, when we know what is uh, interesting to measure, we also have to measure it somehow. And in our case, I was lucky enough to be able to produce single uh, crystals for X-ray analysis. So we performed X-ray analysis of these three interesting compounds, and here you can see the results. Uh, the first column corresponds to the length of the hydrogen bond, second column, the angle, third, the angle, and the, these two columns correspond to the inhibition potency of compounds uh, to galactin 1 and to galactin 3, as I showed you previously. Interesting thing is when you correlate the length of the hydrogen bond with the affinity to galactin 1 and 3, we observe Lennar's linear correlation in case of galactin 1. Whereas in case of Latin 3, there is almost no correlation. This is quite interesting results because it tells us that the uh, gut is one is sensitive to light inflexibility. When we had longer, long uh, hydrogen bond, it uh, tells us that the ligand is more flexible and more flexibility results in better binding. Uh, maybe it's uh, important to say that the value of IC50, which I have shown you here, is. Uh, uh, is uh, indirect to the affinity. The lower the value of IC50, the higher the affinity. So in this case, in this case, this compound with the most flexibility has the highest affinity, and this compound with the uh, with the shortest uh, hydrogen bond has the uh, has the lowest affinity to the one. So this is quite interesting thing. And uh, why is that so? You. Uh, as for this question, the it can lies in the we have to look at the molecular structure of the proteins itself. Uh, we are again lucky enough to obtain the crystal structure of complexes 
our ligands, which got the one and then got the three. So uh, this is mainly uh, due to our collaborations. And uh, when we compare structures of got the one and got the three, you can see that in case of got the one, there is so called L4 loop, which points little towards the ligand side. In the case of got the three, the similar loop points away. When we look at the like uh, the situation in more details, you can see that in the binding side in the collecting one, this corresponds to this. Uh, so in the collecting one, the ligand here is like more crowded. So the binding side is deeper than in case of like three, really much more more shallow. Therefore, it corresponds with the uh, imagination that uh, more flexible ligand can better accommodate into the deeper binding side than in the case of collecting three. So this is. This is a possible explanation. Uh, of course, uh, this is crystal, and crystal is solid, and the biological system is like dynamic liquid system. Uh, so it would be nice to confirm something in the biological system as well. And to do so, we employed the uh, MRC spectroscopy, uh, especially negative chemical shift preparation analysis, because we have in our molecules, in our probes, we have chlorine, and we can measure. 90 MR spectra of fluorine. And this measurement can provide some information about the binding to the protein. Here is the free state of ligand, and here is the bound state of ligand. In specific condition, we can observe two separate signals, each corresponding, one corresponding to bound state, one to the free state, and we can measure the distance between these two signals. Here you can see results. And uh, here is this uh, distance is for the one, for the three, corresponding to molecules two prime and three prime and six n. And this form is important because it tells us it's like a delta delta. So it's differences of differences. Mainly the higher the number, the better, the greater the difference between like these four one particle for you. Uh, let's put it graphically. In the case of Glucky 1, uh, crystal structure, the L4 loop is located in this side, with this, and it's in proximity with the position 2 prime, which is this position 2 prime. And in the case of uh, we observed the highest delta delta uh, variable in the case of 2 prime compound. This uh, corresponds to the, to the uh, Theory that this position to prime is affected by an L4 loop in case of collecting one, but it's not affected in case of collecting three, here it's exposed to the solution. Similarly, when you look at the different position, this one, and when you look at the current position, six, six position is this position is exposed to the solvent in both cases, in case of collecting one as well as collecting three. And when we measure this analysis, uh, there is almost no effect. So it makes some sense. And uh, it confirms the theory that collecting one has an interbinding side of collecting three, and this behaves only in, or also in solution. Uh, to uh, sum up uh, my uh, talk, uh, I've uh, performed the little investigation of collecting one and three. Uh, how was it done? Uh, I, using the, I have used selectively fluorinated disaccharide probes and techniques as X ray of the mark. Uh, what we have been found, uh, Galactin 1 is selective, uh, sensitive to light and flexibility, but the Galactin 3 is not. Why is that so? I'll show you that this is because of the uh, deeper binding side by the pocket in the case of Galactin 1, then in the case of Galactin 3. And the important thing, why it's good to know, uh, it tells us that flexibilization of the system can lead to higher affinity to Galactin 1. And Vice versa, a reunification can achieve a higher selectivity to collecting three. So this can be uh, can have some uh, like consequences for pharmaceutical industry. Hopefully. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very nice talk. Thank you for this very quick paced uh, talk. You've managed to catch up for the lost time. So <laughs> thank you very much. So any questions now? Okay. Just a uh, oh. Sorry. Uh, okay, so let's give uh, priority to Sondin as a member oh, of the group. No problem. Um, on the slide three, please. 
Can you uh, show me the slide three? Yes, that was this one, I think so. Um, you say that uh, you didn't have any um, affinity uh, with the three uh, last compounds. Is it clear? Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. And um, how can you explain that only with the, the presence of the um, fluorine atom on yeah. specific site of the sugar? Exactly. The fluorine atom disrupts the key hydrogen bonding uh, to the protein. If you like, I can show you the crystal structure. It's the cool okay. So, um, did positions. you did Polish you measure? Did you measure some uh, uh, specific, uh, also hydrophobic uh, characteristic of these compounds compared to the other one or not? You mean you mean uh, li lipophilicity or something? Yes, lipophilia yeah, or yeah, yes, yeah, hydrophobicity. Yeah. yeah, we measured we measured lipophilicities of those compounds, and uh, uh, for example, the yeah. see for example this compound, the last one was the uh, most uh, high. Uh, most lipophilic. Uh, uh, no, 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 no. Most hydrophobic. No? Hydrophobic. Okay, the the inverse. Okay, so it's normal that uh, you didn't have uh, any any good um, affinity. In fact, okay. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Okay. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So, um, another question. Okay. So, thank you for a very nice and inspiring talk. Um, okay. I would just would like you mentioned that the higher is the rigidity, the higher is the selectivity. It's more complex, but uh, to uh -huh. put it simple, it's. And what uh, did you mean by selectivity exactly? Uh, I can show you. In this case, uh, uh, yeah. For example, this compound uh, has the highest uh, uh, rigidity of the system. And here you can see uh, that you know, there is the highest ratio between uh, ah, yeah. the and the and the so ratio in between this case, the selectivity like between two galaxies. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Later on. Okay. Thank you very much. So I think we will stop here to uh, really keep the schedule uh, to what was originally intended. So I'd like to call to the floor Hoyte uh, Kama who will give us a talk on organoproteinium glycomimetics as selective galactin-1 inhibitors, so we stay in the topic. Please share the screen. How do I start the presentation here? Okay. So, hello everyone, my name is Wojtje Kamala and I'm hopefully finishing PhD student here under the supervisor of Tomasz Trasha and my supervising expert is uh, Dr. Talban. I will have a really short talk about part of my work that I did here for my PhD and those are organomet organorotenium glycomimetics that we found out that can have a really good use as a selective galactin-1 inhibitors. My colleague gave you a nice introduction about galactins. So I would like just to point out that they can be both intracellular and extracellular. And depending on the place where they are, their concentration and their presented binding partners that they can get interact with, they can have different functions. They usually form dimers as galactin-1 or oligomers as galactin-3. Some other galactins form tandem-like structures, and they connect two places within one cell or two cells together, and they act as a medium allowing cell-cell communication or starting some signaling pathways or starting some biochemical processes that leads to other stuff. Most studied are human galactin 1 and galactin 3 because a long time ago in the 1980s, we have found out that their overexpression is connected with many pathological states. It started with inflammation. However, right now we are mostly focused on fibrosis in cancer. And the overexpression of galactin 1 and galactin 3 are often used as a marker to check how the tumor is progressing and 
they're correlating with the patient's prognosis. Usually, if the patient has really high levels of galactin-1 and galactin-3, the prognosis of the patient is usually poor. Uh, those two galactins have similar binding places and are often overexpressed together. However, for uh, really targeted and preferable treatment, we really need to inhibit or completely silence only one of those galactins because their actions are different. They are really a hot topic in the pharmaceutical research with pretty much every major pharmaceutical consortium or group having their research focused on some kind of galactin inhibitors. Right now, there are more than 20 structures or compounds under worldwide patent protections, including several of them in clinical trials in clinical phases. Uh, my compounds will focus on inhibiting extracellular galactin-1 in tissues. So some things that the high level of extracellular galactin-1 does. It uh, interacts with leukocytes, especially T cells, and it prevents them to enter the pathological tissue, the tumor usually, from bloodstream. And at the same time, it pushes the present leukocytes, T cells, from the tumor to limbs somewhere away. For the T cells that actually stays there, it inactivates them. It binds to the lactosamine structures that are on the surface of the T cells and either stops their function, or if there is too much of galactin ones, it starts a biochemical pathway that leads to apoptosis of the T cells and tumor can phagocytate the rest of the T cells and grow even more. At the same time, the high levels of galactin ones interact with the lactosamine or oligosaccharide structures that are on top of tumor cells, tumor cells, and they reduce the adhesion of two tumor cells together, which leads to one or group of tumor cells to leave the main tumor and get somewhere else, get into the bloodstream or get into other tissues, which is called metastasis. At the same time, the high level of galactin-1 also interact with the healthy tissues all around the tumor, doing pretty much the same. Only instead of the healthy tissues leaving, the healthy cells leaving the tissue as going away, it creates a holes into the healthy tissues, which the tumor cells can get into, get there and start spreading and causing even more problems. One of the last things that is proved for high levels of galactin ones is that they help the HIV virus to stack onto leukocytes. Since the galactin one has two binding place, it can bind the leukocytes on one side and bind the HIV virus on the other side and bring them together or keep them together, uh, which leads to high, high IV infections. And this, uh, the first step, the adhesion of the HIV virus and the leukocytes is bottleneck of the HIV infection. So if we help them because of the high level of galactin-1, we speed up the infection, which leads to the bad patient prognosis. Uh, my colleague spoke a lot about binding places in galactin-1 and galactin-3. I just want to point out that the binding place is really similar. If we can see the amino sites that uh, are causing the main interactions, they are pretty much the same. Here we can see a structure of lactosamine and the amino acids from both galactins that interact with them. The lactosamine has a micromolar affinity to both galactin-1 and galactin-3 in tens to low numbers of micromoles depending on the method used, and they have pretty much no selectivity or the selectivity is really low. Uh, here, we can see examples of galactin inhibitors that are currently in the clinical trials. Here we can see the uh, GD139, formerly known as the TD139. This compound has a nanomolar affinity to galactin-3, so about a thousand times better binding to galactin-3 than the natural compounds. However, it has only 10 times uh, tenfold selectivity to galactin-3 over galactin-1, so it's usable, but doesn't. Nothing good. Uh, it has a problem with solubility. This compound is really low soluble. So the only use that the galacto biochemicals who's uh, funding the physical 
trials, clinical trials found for them is for the treatment of adiopathic pulmonary fibrosis by inhalating this compound in form of pyrorosols. After some time, the same company developed this compound, GB1211, which has pretty much the same affinity to galactin-3, however, uh, 10 times better selectivity to galactin-3 uh, over galactin-1. And it's in a phase two of clinical trials for treatment of uh, one type of cancer. So far, no selective, low nanomolar, good binding inhibitor for galactin-1 is nowhere. In my uh, thesis, for my PhD thesis, I have focused on uh, subsidizing these RE structures that are in the known inhibitors of galactins for organometallic moieties that contains RE, however, are not planar, but are 3D. I prepared three times of these structures, and here I will focus only on this one. We've got, from the first testing of these compounds, we've got really interesting results. So we hide those compounds for quite some time. So you're actually the first public audience who see the structures of two lead two target molecules that we have prepared. First one is based on the lactosamine scaffold. And we found out that this compound is a single digit micromole affinity to galactin one and more than 100 fold selectivity to galactin one and over galactin three. Significantly better results we've got on this compound that is based on the theory galactoside scaffold similar to the PD or GB139. And these compounds have a single digit nanomolar affinity to galactin one, which is really unprecedented and uh, more than uh, five order, five degree of order magnitude selectivity to galactin one to galactin three. So this compound, it's more than thousand times better affinated to galactin one than natural ligands and significantly worse ligand for galactin three comparing to natural result, natural ligands. Just a few words about synthesis. We've created a synthesis and reduced the synthesis up to 10 steps for both of the compounds with the total yield around 20%. The synthesis still requires in about half of the steps some column chromatography. So there are still need for upgrading that to be able to upgrade, upscale the synthesis. But as it is now, we can prepare the target compounds in low gram yields. Uh, last month, in April, we had applied for patent protection of both of these compounds with some modification and big part of the synthesis uh, as a potential auxiliary agent in the treatment of cancer and other pathological states connected with galactin-1. <clears throat> the effective galactin-1 inhibition in the tumor should lead to reduce the tumor immunosuppression and allowing the immune system to get rid of the tumor or just keep it in check and slow down its progression. And at the same time, it should reduce the cancer cell migration and invasiveness ability, thus reducing the risk of tumor metastasis. Uh, since the results are really surprising in the state of art, we have used three different methods to be sure that we really have the claim affinity and selectivity. First one is the fluorescent anisotropy, which is the to-go method to measure the affinity between ligands and galactins. However, our compound, target compound two, is significantly better ligand than any known fluorescent probe, and we're not able to get the current number. We will have to create a better fluorescent probe based on our ruthenium compound to get exact binding. We were more successful using ELISA and uh, another approach using fluorescence of uh, tyrosine groups in the galactin binding space, which proved both the nanomolar selectivity and uh, the nanomolar affinity to galactin 1 and selectivity. We've tested in vitro cytotoxicity of this compound, and both compounds are completely non toxic to both cancer and uh, healthy cancer cell lines which agrees with our premise that they can only get into the extracellular space and not inside the, spell, inside the cells. Moving forward, uh, 
we will try to explain the high affinity to galactin one and great selectivity to galactin one over galactin three. And we are applying for additional funding in the current uh, call by the Ministry of Health to enable and fund the in vivo experiments in mice models. Thank you. Thanks to these grants for funding my research, all of my collaborators, and all of you for my attention. Thank you very much. So, questions now? Sandrine? Uh, first? Or, no? No? Okay, so we're done. Okay, thank you for a very exciting talk. Uh, uh, okay, I have uh, just one uh, short question. Mm -hmm. So you were mentioning something what is called non-small cell lung cancer. So it's mm -hmm. some particular kind of lung cancer. Yes. So, okay. Okay. So mm -hmm. it's, it's an application. Mm -hmm. And then I'm just wondering if you were measuring the selectivity uh, and affinity for binding, like let's say comparing the galactin one and three. Yes. But. Uh, what about some other it's molecules in, present in the human body? So what would, uh, would I mean for the potential use as in, in therapy? Mm -hmm. So, so is the it general, possible kind of in vitro the, to, to guess and assess eventual affinity? We can assess in vitro cytotoxicity, which we've done on, I think, seven different cell lines. Mm -hmm. And all of them were not toxic. Uh, the, Pharmaceutical general cytotox general toxicity has to be tested on mm -hmm. mice models, mm -hmm. and if we get funding, it will be one of the first things that will be done. Okay. But okay. so far, we didn't get a chance to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Just a question, please, okay. is, if it is possible. Yes. yes. Uh, the slide before you speak uh -huh. about the synthesis. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. That was here. Okay. So um, it is um, a click chemistry. I think so. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, introduction of these uh, compounds is uh, click chemistry. Yes. And um, concerning the click chemistry, it is uh, 81 percent uh, yield. I think so. I, uh, saw I think the click chemistry gives over 90 percent yield. It's actually the steps before that that lowers the yield. But the click chemistry in this case works perfectly. Yes. Think. Okay. And. Um, what was the condition for this um, a click chemistry? Uh, it's uh, a a click classical chemistry. classical condition or uh, classical adapted? condition? The super uh, sulfate and yes. ascorbic acid in okay. the form of medicine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. No problem. And do you realize this uh, click chemistry in um, uh, in in an organic solvent or in water? Yes. I, I have in dimethylformamide and yes. found out that it's necessary to do the click chemistry in the presence of acetyl to be able to use extractions to get rid of the copper. Uh, yes, so I understand. Okay, mm -hmm. no problem. And did you have any leaching of uh, copper in your uh, product after that? Uh, if I if I do the extraction proper extractions, uh, I have no copper proved by the IC. Yes. Yeah. yeah, be careful. Uh, I think you you can have some uh, nanoparticles of copper in your uh, mixture, perhaps to 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 realize a, a small chromatography. I don't know if you did some chromatography. Yes, yes the chromatography for okay. extractions to get rid okay. of excessive uh, ethylene. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but okay. we check all the final compounds for the for the copper before the cytotoxicity testing. So we yes, know. I think so. Them. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a question. Yes. It's not a problem anymore because we've successfully applied last month. So after the application for the patent, I can <laughs> show it with Woodward. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, that's what I've been told by the potent lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just one uh, small question uh, from my side. You said that the solubility of your products was low. Uh, no, I said the solubility of uh, this compound is really low. The solubility... Okay. Solu uh, yeah, but yeah. the solubility in what? 
uh, soluble in water solution. Okay, yeah. because the this solubility, is important. Yes, yeah, yes, you can yes, dissolve yes, this yes. in anything exactly. else. So, yeah. The solubility of our compound in water solution is great because it's anionic. Uh, we yeah. have a two plus anion with two yeah, carbons. Um, like, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. As long as we need it only in extracellular space and not inside the cells, it's perfect. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So, any more questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for your impressive talk. Uh, you used such a term like nanomolar affinity. Yes. What is that? It <laughs> means that the uh, affinity described by pretty much anything that we would like, uh, the inhibition constant, the KD constant, or the IC50, it's in nanomolar values. Okay. And it's based from the general formula of... Uh, Galactine or like the proteins plus ligand forming the mm -hmm. adducts and the, mm -hmm. the the usual definition by the yes yes exactly okay. Mm -hmm. thank you okay um uh, any more questions fast yes oh, okay well go ahead you showed uh, uh, the series of uh, different molecular structures uh -huh. did you perform the molecule uh, structure calculation uh, <laughs> our colleague at the IOCB are trying to do the simulations yeah, but perfect to confirm to confirm uh, the, the structure is confirmed by the NMR and regular organoid yeah. organic characterizations yes, but but not by calculation not by calculation and is it possible? To calculate, we're trying to calculate or like to simulate binding to the galactine and use the calculation to explain the unprecedented affinity. And it's difficult <laughs> for the for the organoritanium moiety. Yeah, they they don't really like that. Stuff. Yeah. So, <laughs> but hopefully there is some progress. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I think we're past the allotted time for today. So I would like to thank our speaker again. Thank you.